dismissed from drama school with a note that read, wasting her time, she's too shy to put her best foot forward. Turned down by the Decca recording company who said, we don't like their sound and guitar music is on the way out. A failed soldier, farmer, and real estate agent. At 38 years old, he went to work for his father as a handyman. Cut from the high school basketball team, he went home, locked himself in his room, and cried. A teacher told him he was too stupid to learn anything, and he should go into a field where he might succeed by virtue of his pleasant personality. Fired from a newspaper because he lacked imagination and had no original ideas. His fiance died, he failed in business twice, he had a nervous breakdown, and he was defeated in eight elections. If you've never failed, you've never lived. I persevered yesterday. I took my bike with my wife and her bike. Yes, yes, that's right. There's a difference there in the kin. So I took a bicycles, went to Swamp Rabbit Trail, and I was doing my thing. I got my three miles in. Yeah, I, was, I, I broke a sweat. And yes, I was persevering. And uh, so <clears throat> anyway, I was getting ready to turn off to go in there where they sell the scones and the biscuits and all that stuff. Jennifer looked back and said, where are you going? I said, I'm going where I always go, to the park bench, so I can watch people for about an hour. And she said, well, I'm going to do about 12. I thought, 12 minutes? And she said, no, 12 miles. And I said, well, you might as well go six and then come six back, and I'll be right here waiting on you at the park. So I persevered, didn't I, Jennifer? Absolutely. <laughs> so anyway... But anyway, good to have you here. We're talking about perseverance today. I know that's a big word that we don't use an awful lot in our vocabulary. But, um, but you know, the, the church at uh, Philadelphia was a church that never quit, even when they had all kinds of things going against them, and they persevered. In other words, watch this. We live in a time that when, uh, when temptation comes, you know, well, the easiest thing to do is just give in to it. And, um, you know, when, when, when a new trend comes in our world, the, bit, the easiest thing to do is just, just follow that trend. You know, that's not the way it was in the Church of Philadelphia. Jesus gave them a commendation because they overcame every obstacle and they stayed true to the Word of God. Amen? Here, here's what I think that, it, here's, the, here's where I think we're living. In two weeks from today, we'll be doing the sermon, the church at Laodicea which I believe that's the church that is representative of the age that we live in right now, the Laodicean age. Uh, Jim Nelms will be speaking next Sunday in the main sanctuary at 1030, one service, and then on the 10th we'll finish this series up with Laodicea. But I want to share with you what God showed me this morning about 515. And I searched this when I first hit the floor to make sure I had the right text. Here, here's what the Apostle Paul told Timothy. He says, preach the word... Be ready in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. What that's saying is that in this day that we live in, our responsibility, Paul was telling Timothy as a church, is to keep preaching the Word. Amen? What's the Word, Pastor? The Word is the Word of God. It's, the, it's God's Word, the Bible. And keep preaching the Word, but when you preach it, don't beat people over the head with it. What you have to do, you have to learn how to correct, rebuke, and encourage, but have patience when you're doing it. And make sure you're patient with people. By the way, this is in 2 Timothy chapter 4. But then here's what, here's what Paul told Timothy. He said, because I warn you, the time is coming when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Does anybody hear bells ringing yet? That might be part of our day that we're living in. There will be people that won't put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers who will say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth 
and turn aside to myths, but you keep your head in all situations. Endure hardship. Do the work of an evangelist. Discharge all the duties of your ministry. So I just want to share that. That's, that's, we, we are living in a time that you're a, you're, you've got a dual role. You're a citizen, but you're also a member of the kingdom of God that operates under one set of principles, and that's God's word. Totally committed, surrendered to him. And I live in it, you live in it. And I think we all feel the pressure of that. But when we come to this church in Revelation chapter 3, verse 7, the key verse is up on the screen there now is verse 8. And this is what we're going to read. It says this, Jesus said, I know your deeds. See, I've placed before you an open door that no one can shut. I know that you have little strength. Yet you have kept my word. Church, he's commending this church for keeping the word. The word of God. You have kept my word and you have not denied my name. Man, that could, we could preach for two days on that. The name of Jesus. I am the way, the truth, and the life. There is no other way to the Father God except through me. So that's who we're talking about here. So the word perseverance is the key word again. And perseverance... There's a simple definition up there that says this, persistence in doing something despite difficulty or delay in achieving success. In other words, check this out, guys. You are living in a world that doesn't really like Jesus the way we do, and we have to accept that because Satan is the prince and power of the air. Now, what happens? It seems like we're getting nowhere. It seems like we're getting nowhere. Well, that's where persistence is important because that's when you keep on doing something regardless of whether you've achieved success yet or not. That's persistence. It's like my, I mentioned this morning that I heard a woman say this once and now I'm pretty sure that it was my mother when she was raising four sons between 19, born in 1961 to 1967. If you do the math, she had four wild redneck boys within uh, six and a half years. She said these words. She says, Lord, give me patience because if you give me strength, I'm going to need bail money to go with it. So she was raising us without trying to kill us in the process. So she persevered. She uh, had patience. But as I look around this room, though, I see a lot of good examples of great patience and perseverance. I really do. Some of you have stories that you need to tell the world how you overcame, how you persevered, and now here you are still standing and and living the gospel out in your life. You've already suffered greatly, but you've stayed, uh, you've kept the faith, and you've stayed the course. As a matter of fact, some of you have become patient in suffering, and that's made you who you are today. Some of us can really say that. Hear me, church. You can say that, that here you are today standing faithful to God, and part of what you suffered is the reason why you're standing here today. You've overcome. It's like that journalist that was assigned to the Jerusalem Bureau, and she took an apartment right above the Wailing Wall. And every day she looked out, and she sees this old Jewish man praying vigorously every day. So this journalist finally goes down and introduces herself to the old man. And she said this. She asked him this question. You come every day to this wall. How long have you done that? And by the way, what are you praying for? So the old man replied. He said, you know, I've come here to pray every day for 25 years. In the morning, I pray for the brotherhood of man and for world peace. And then I go home and I have a cup of tea. And then I come back, and I pray for the eradication of illness and disease in our world. That's what I pray for. So this amazed that journalist, and and she said, well, how does it make you feel to come here every day for 25 years and pray for these things? And he looked up at her, and he says, well, it's sort of like I'm talking to a wall. And he was. And that's where some of you are living. That's why some of you have been tempted just to jump off the boat. It's just like talking to a wall. 
I've been praying for 25 years for some of the same prayers. And I'm not about to quit. Because when I feel like quitting, that's when I start thinking about that funeral I preached one time for a woman that was 59 years old, never did drink a bit of alcohol in her life, and died of liver disease. And for 32 years, she had a husband that hated her and made fun of her faith. I was at a prayer meeting one time at this old, older lady's house. I call her an older lady because she was 59, about my age now, but I was like 26 then. And I remember her husband making fun of her for having all these religious people over here. And this guy seemed like the most, the worst man that anybody could ever, ever want to ever live a day with. But at her funeral, the man sit there in his wheelchair, wheeled it up to the altar, and gave his heart to Jesus Christ. And me and my flesh, I wanted to look down there and say, how dare you do that? Treated her like a dog for 33 years. And she died a horrible death. But you know what? God looks at things in a little bit different way than we do. He looks at things through the eyes of, of, uh, of salvation and grace and not giving up and being patient. But, uh, but sometimes the Christian life is like that. You know, we go, it feels like we're going through the motions and it feels like we're under adverse circumstances and it feels like that we're still not experiencing the life that we deserve. But as Christians and as the church, we're called upon by Christ to persevere, to hold on to our faith and continue moving forward with our faith. And as we look at these churches, Five out of the seven had no commendations. Jesus said nothing good about five out of these seven churches. Only two, the one we're talking about today and the church at Smyrna. Does he commend them? So my question is, is what set them apart? What set the Philadelphia church apart? What was it about their church or the believers there that made them different? I've got a few thoughts about that. Here's the first one. Number one, they accepted the appropriate authority. They accepted the appropriate authority. Verse 7 says this, To the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These are the words of him who is, here's a bullet point, holy and true, and who holds the key of David. Two bullet points right there. What he opens, no man can shut. And what he shuts... No man can open. And I'd like to put a little trail there and put, even if it is 2022. When God decides to shut something down, it's done. When he decides to open things up, it's open. And so, so, so he, he, that, that, that verse there shows his authority. Man, I heard a story once that I just couldn't wait to share this morning about Sam Bronman, the late CEO of Seagram Company. He entered a crowded conference room one day, and as he was looking for the nearest chair to jump down in, he just sat down right in the middle of all the chairs, and, and one of his young assistants said, No, Mr. Bronman, you're not supposed to sit there. You're supposed to sit at the head of the table. And Mr. Bronman looked up and said, Young man, wherever I sit is the head of the table. That's what you and I can say about our Savior. That's what you and I can say about our Christ. That's what you and I can say about the one that died for our sins. Amen? That no matter where Jesus is, is the head of the table. And the only way that we're going to make it, listen, somebody needs to hear this today. The Holy Spirit has already told me. The only way you're going to make it in your faith is if you recognize the perfect, total, unwavering authority of God in this world. It's the only way you're going to make it. It's the only way I'm going to make it. Some of us, some of, some of us not, not, not me in this, some of you may be suffering because you think that there's something else out there that needs your allegiance, needs your dedication, needs your commitment. Listen online. Some of you are watching online that need to make Jesus the king and authority of your life. That's the only way we're going to make it. We're just treading water. We're just spinning around in the dirt. As long as we think, oh, a little bit of this, a little bit of that. No, listen, it's all Jesus. Amen? <laughs> and, that's what, and that's what the Word is saying here. It says, write this letter to the angel of the church. This is the message from the one who is holy and true. 
Man, when I read that, I thought, I need to get out some of my old Bob Black um, uh, books to study the definitions of these words that he made us do several years ago. And man, I started looking into this holy and true business. This is the one that's holy and true. Three descriptions of the authority of Christ are given in this passage. He is holy, he is true, and he holds the key of David. And, and only twice in the New Testament are the adjectives holy and true ever mentioned together. Only two times. This time, and there was one other reference to God the Father as being holy and true. The word holy means this, separated. Jesus is separate. He is to be distinct. He is set apart from the crowd. Jesus is like no other, amen? Amen. He's like nobody else. And, and that's why we need to crown him and throne him as the King of kings and the Lord of lords and accept his authority. He's the ultimate authority. Now, the word true, by the way, is two meanings on that. One of them means he is in total contrast to falsehood. Anything out there that might be false or is false, Jesus is in total contrast. He is all truth. He is true. And, and then the other definition for that word means the one who is real. You ever seen any commercials about the real thing or the real something? Man, I just about started World War III in the other service. I started talking about mayonnaise. Got everybody all ticked off. Yeah, I shouldn't. Have. Yeah, listen, you, there, there's some new students here today from Michigan. Don't ever bring up mayonnaise in the South. If you don't like Dukes, people's going to think you're weird. But everybody knows that that Miracle Whip is the real deal. Everybody knows it. You just haven't, re, haven't admitted it yet. Yeah, so I just about just upset the whole service over there talking about mayonnaise this morning, about the real mayonnaise. But, you know, we, 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 can, we can look at all that and say this. When it comes to Jesus Christ, when it says that he is the one that is holy and true, you can put it all into one sentence and say this. Jesus is the ultimate reality. If you're looking for reality, look no further than Jesus Christ. If you're looking for the real deal, look for Christ himself. And that's what these two words mean. He is holy and true. But then uh, the, the writer throws out these words, the key of David. And the key of David that Jesus possesses is a symbol of his authority in that he opens doors that nobody can shut and he shuts doors that nobody can open. That is actually a verse that comes all the way from the Old Testament, Isaiah 22, verse 22, when you read the story of King Hezekiah's servant, Elohim who was given the key of David and who alone had the authority to admit the presence of the king. So the point here is this. Only Jesus has the authority to permit entrance into the new Jerusalem, the kingdom of God, and heaven itself. What is that saying? I'll just try to put it all in a nutshell. What that's saying is if we are giving authority to any other name except the name of Jesus... And if, in fact, it is true that he holds that key of entrance into the kingdom of God, that means that without Jesus, we're not going anywhere. That's why Jesus could stand up in John 14, 6 and say these words, I am the way, the truth, and the life. I'm not bragging about me. I'm not, Jesus didn't say, I'm, I'm not bragging. I'm not being boastful. But I am the way. I am the truth. And I am the life. There is no other way to that kingdom of heaven, that kingdom of God, that new Jerusalem, except through me. So that's why, church, we need to place him as the ultimate authority. Can I hear an amen? amen? Jesus needs to be that. And that's why some of us are confused. That's why some of us are discouraged. That's why some of us in, a, in the Christian church, we don't, we're teeter-tottering. And reason why, Jesus may not be your total authority. Now, I'm not judging you. I don't know who you are, but the Holy Spirit just wanted me to speak that. So if that's you, you may want to try it because Jesus is the authority. Now, let's get, that, let's get something else across here real quick. So 
I, I wonder, though, how many Christians, being that Jesus holds all that authority, it means that Jesus will give us a blessed life while we live in this world if we are totally committed to Him. And I wonder how many Christians are sitting here this morning that, you know, you might be saying, you know what, I love Jesus, but I'm not totally committed. It's going to take a very brave man or woman to say, that's me, because of the culture we live in. The culture that we live in, it seems like we're either in or out. There's no in-between. We're either an atheist or we're a Jesus follower. But I'm sure there's some of us, Wesley and somewhere, that love Jesus, but we're not totally committed. Well, there's some scripture I want to show you about that. The first one, and I'm asking for the uh, one in the sound booth, I may have a mistake on there, so I'm going to ask your, for your forgiveness. Uh, Numbers 32, verse 11. Here's what it says. Because they have not followed me wholeheartedly. Oops, you mean there is a way that we can follow but not wholeheartedly? Yes, absolutely. That could be happening in your life today. I love Jesus, but I'm not totally following wholeheartedly. Not one of those who were... 20 years old or more when they came up out of Egypt will see the promised land or the land I promised on oath to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Then the next verse, Numbers 14, 24, says this, but because my servant Caleb has a different spirit, and watch this, and follows me wholeheartedly, even all the way back in the Old Testament, God was looking for people that weren't casually committed to him. He's looking for people that are wholeheartedly committed to Him. Thank you, Holy Spirit. This might be why some of the outside world absolutely despises the church today. See, I'm a church person, man. I believe in it. I believe in the church of Jesus Christ. I believe we are His mouthpiece in this world to bring people from far and near into a relationship with Him. But I think there's a whole lot of following going on, but it's not wholehearted following. And people look at us like, what right do we have to tell them anything if we're going to be hypocrites in this world? They've got a point. Pretty doggone good point, to be honest with you. So I love the church. I'm a church person. I'll be supporting the church of Jesus Christ as much as I can and even more until the day I die. And I'm not going anywhere except up one day. Jesus died for me to be a part of the church. But I can tell you this, I don't want to be listed as one of those people that love Jesus. Listen, church, but I don't wholeheartedly follow Jesus. We're going to talk about that on July the 10th. That's called lukewarmness. And Jesus said, I'd rather you be hot or cold because if you're not, I'm going to spit you out of my mouth. It's a serious game we're playing here, and I believe we're coming to the end of it soon. And so, so, uh, so he, he, he said that Caleb had a different spirit and, um, and, and follows me wholeheartedly, and I'm going to bring him into that land that he went to, and his descendants will inherit it. So God... Blessed. This is where the, the rule of, of, of sowing and reaping takes, takes hold. We, we reap what we sow. In other words, if we're not going to be a wholehearted follower of God, then there might be some blessings we're going to miss out on while we're here. And I'm not about to say yet that you're not going to make it to heaven. I'm just going to say you're going to have a pretty hard time getting there. The only way that we're going to be too, truly blessed is when we totally put Jesus in authority, and we say, Lord, show me in your word how I should walk and follow you and how I should love you and love others as myself, and show me what to do next, Lord. Hallelujah. That's the church. Amen? None of us are perfect. I can tell you I'm not perfect, but as soon as I realize I'm not, I'm going to get on my knees and I'm going to say, God, let's do this again. Let's start over. Isaiah 119 says, if you are willing and obedient you will eat the good things of the land. If you are willing, it. what if I'm not? Well, then read, think about that. What if I'm not willing? What if I'm not, what if I just love Jesus, but I don't want to follow him wholeheartedly? Then you're probably not going to eat the good things of this land. But if you want to, if you want to follow God wholeheartedly, God promises you 
that you're going to eat the good of the land. And then the second point is this. This church of Philadelphia, they built on a solid foundation. We'll read verse 8 again. I know your deeds. See, I have placed before you an open door that no, man, no one can shut. And I know that you have little strength, yet you have kept my word and you have not denied my name. They were on a solid foundation. You know, other than riding three miles on my bicycle yesterday, Kenny, I was studying about the Leaning Tower of Pisa. I get involved in these things sometimes. I just can't quit. I just got to find out. I'm just a curious person. I got to find out why in the world hasn't this thing fallen yet? Will it ever fall? Well, I got some information. I think you're going to appreciate it too. All right? So the first thing I found out is that every year now, scientists travel, you know, to measure the building's slow descent. They go over there and they measure every year to see if it has fallen anymore. And, um, whoa, check that out. Leaning Tower of Pisa doesn't fall on our building. So, yeah. But by the way, the, the, the Leaning Tower of Pisa is leaning in a way that it's, they say, well, somebody predicted in the year 2014, but it didn't happen that it was going to fall in 2014 and crush this restaurant right beside it. So it made my curious mind start seeking again. So I looked, and sure enough, there's a restaurant right there beside the Leaning Tower of Pisa that it's supposed to fall on. That's where the scientists meet whenever they go there. Every year, they meet in that restaurant, man. They're, they're daredevils. They meet there in this restaurant, and they talk about, after they get their measurements, how much it's moved. Well, guess what? Does anybody want to guess how much, on average, that Leaning Tower of Pisa moves every single year. It, what is it? A centimeter. Well, I'll break it down to this. One twentieth of an inch. One twentieth of an inch, and right now it is 17 feet out of plumb. You know, and now they're starting to find out more about this phenomenon. The word Pisa means marshy land. And that gives some clue on why this tower began to lean even before it was completed. And um, as a matter of fact, the foundation is only 10 feet deep on marshy land. So, and it's staying, it's staying, it's not falling because right now the bottom is heavier than the top is, whatever term you want to call that. But as soon as that happens, it's going to crash on that restaurant. Hopefully those scientists won't be in there eating a, a salad or something, you know, when that happens. So, um, so, so he, what, what's that mean to me, Pastor? Well, I want to talk about what that means to the Church of Philadelphia. The Church of Philadelphia understood that if their spiritual foundation was faulty, the entire church would fall. And that's what they understood. They had to have a foundation that was built on the Word of God. He says, you have been faithful to the Word. You have been faithful to the foundation. Your foundation is the Word, and that's what's holding you up right now. And friends, listen, 2022 Christians everywhere, that's the only reason we are existing today is because God's Word is holding us up. God's Word is our foundation. And, um, and, and I want us to focus just a little bit here, though, on that uh, one uh, little sentence. You have little strength. The reason why this church had little strength is of the seven churches, this was the smallest church of the seven. They were a small church, small congregation. They were not politically powerful. They had no influence in the city. They had no riches or resources that the other church had. The only thing they had, my friends, is they were obedient to Jesus during times of of trial. When pressure came, they never turned their back on God. They never turned their back on God's plan. They refused to deny Him. They understood that obedience to Christ and a continual acknowledgement of Him as Lord was foundational to the success of their faith. And that's what's going to be the success of our faith, is when we will simply be obedient to the Word of God and continually acknowledge that Christ is Lord. And the same needs to happen in this day and age. 
Christ will not deem us successful based on our influence, on our resources, on our attendance, on the talents of all of our members. God will say that we are successful if we stay true to the Word of God. Stay true to Him. So when the tide of the culture turns against us, and when even many in the church ask us to water down our belief in Christ, He calls us to remain true to Him. And church, I want to say this before we take that last point. There is nothing wrong with loving God and loving people and staying true to His Word no matter if anybody agrees with us or not. There's a need for that in our world. That's a godly virtue. It's a godly virtue when you can stand on the Word of God and still love people. Amen? It is. It's a godly virtue when you can stay true to the Word and say, you know what? I love you. I mean, I love you. And love people enough to share our story with them. How we were lost in sin. Jesus came along and rescued us and gave, put our feet on the solid rock. And he can make all the difference. But make sure that he stays as the king of your life. And then the last thing I want to share is this. Is they also took advantage of every opportunity. And they had an optimistic attitude. There's another thing that the church needs to be seen having today in 2022. It's an optimistic attitude. Let's take an inventory real quick of your life. Look at your life. I, I'm not even being judgmental. I can say this when I look at your life. You don't have it too bad. I don't have it too bad. My life is pretty good at this point. Your life is pretty good at this point. I wish you had seen Francis Chan last Wednesday night in our sanctuary Bible study. Francis Chan was taking one dollar bills and wadding them up and throwing them at the congregation. And he said people were ducking and knocking them on the floor. Two dollar bills, two of them in a row, boom, boom. Somebody just, ooh, don't want that, you know. 90% of the rest of the world would have been fighting to hit the floor to get those $2 because that would have been about a week's salary or even a day salary in some levels. So look at your life. You don't have it too bad. I don't have it too bad. I need to be optimistic. Now, let me give you a little illustration on how that can happen. A man had two sons. One was an optimist. One was a pessimist to an extreme. He got tired of it. Somebody suggested a psychologist. Took, it to, took them both to a psychologist. Psychologist evaluate them. Yep, one of them is a pessimist, one's an optimist. I think I can fix them. How can you do it, doctor? Well, let's just do this. We'll, we've got one room over here filled up with all of the toys that a young boy could ever want. Let's put the pessimist in there. Put the pessimist in there played around a few toys, within an hour he was complaining, I don't have anybody to play with. He said, okay, let's take the optimist. We'll put him in this room. And I want to warn you, it's filled full of horse manure. Put him in there. And the doctor heard a commotion going on. That kid was in there just sorting through everything, getting every, the whole place a mess. Dr. Vance said, what's going on in here? And that boy said, man, as much horse manure is in here, there's got to be a pony here somewhere. Now, I know that's kind of, well, raunchy before lunch and stuff. And I say to say this, I hope when you're eating your lunch today, when you're eating your $19.38 steak, that you are a little bit optimistic about where you are right now. And when you jump in your 2019 or no, it's a, we're going to have an old car this time, 2018, with 40,000 miles on it. I hope you realize how good you have it right now. When you go to your job and you check in and, and you have a direct deposit to your bank and in excess of $1,000 next week, I hope you understand how blessed you are, how optimistic you need to be. See, here's what the world needs to see today, church. The world outside these walls of this church need to see 
the church having fun because it is. We sang a little song over there at the end of that service, and I, man, I tell you what, if I thought that Kenny Tierno knew it, I'd ask you to sing it. And I, I know you don't want to hear me sing it. I accidentally had left my mic on over there, and I sang it, and it was, then I scared myself. But it's called, It Will Be Worth It All When We See Jesus. It will be worth it all when we see Christ. No more sorrow, no more pain, no more crying. Just think, that's our future, church. And we get to go out there today and do the hobby of our dreams and watch golf all day long and sleep and golf and sleep and golf. I get to do that today. And I can wake up and start studying God's Word and see what my future looks like. Listen, what I'm saying is that, is that Jesus gave the church at Philadelphia an opportunity for optimism. It's when he said these words. He said, I know your deeds. I have placed before you an open door that no one can shut. He's saying, church, you can be optimistic. You can be optimistic because I've opened the door that nobody can shut. Now, I want to close with this. What in the world? Maybe, maybe you want to study this out. What is that door that he's talking about? I'm going to take a guess at it. Knowing that Jesus is all about winning people to, to the kingdom, I think he's talking about the doors of opportunities in all of our lives that we can invest in somebody else and share our story with them so that they might have a chance at this optimistic life like we do. I think that's what he's talking about. I think he's talking about the door of evangelism. And here's my challenge before we, before we sing. My challenge is this this week. Every place we go, if it's off of an elevator into an office chair waiting on your doctor's appointment, when that person comes there and sits down beside you, I pray that we will ask ourselves and ask God, is this a door of opportunity? Is this what you're talking about, Lord? Because I don't know what other door he's talking about. Door to get a new job, maybe, but I think Jesus is more interested in you winning your neighbor to Christ than you getting a new job, by the way. I think he's talking about doors of evangelism. So every opportunity we have this week... Think about this. Is this another opportunity, another door that's opening for me to share my story and tell my story? Now, I would just like for us, and I don't even want the praise team to come yet. I just feel like the Holy Spirit is speaking. Let's bow our heads. Maybe you're here this morning and you say, Pastor, I'm one of those people. Oh, I love Jesus. But I'm not wholeheartedly committed. There's still some things in my life that I want to control. And if that's you, God has grace for you today. He has forgiveness for you today for trying to sort it out on your own. Lord, I love you, but Life is just a little bit better right now when I have a little bit of control. And Jesus is saying, I just want you to surrender it all. Even during hard times, even during times of trial, this church put Jesus as the ultimate authority. Who's the ultimate authority in your life today? I'm just going to ask you, if that's you, just raise your hand and say, Pastor, that's me. I need to make that commitment. God bless you over there. Amen, amen, amen. I need to let go and let God and surrender it all to Him because life is going to get all chaotic here pretty soon. So, Father, help us this morning.
Help us today as the worship team comes, Lord, and as we stand this morning. I pray, God, that you would just bless us this morning as we worship, as we sing, and as we give you praise. Father, if there's anybody here this morning during this time of worship that would like to just have a moment of prayer, God, there will be somebody here to pray. And I pray that the Holy Spirit would bless that time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's all stand this morning. And let's worship the Lord. But just give it all to Him today, church. That's the only way we're going to make it. Amen.